Welcome back. Today we are going to finish up Roman numeral one on the basics of fluids. So to begin, I want you to think about an instrument that's used to measure pressure, something besides a tire gauge. Maybe you've seen it if you've ever watched the weather on the news. I'm talking about a barometer. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how a barometer is made and what those numbers mean when you watch the weather. Imagine, if you will, a long skinny tube and a small bowl. Well, the way a barometer works is mercury is poured into this tube. It's then plugged up and turned upside down into the bowl. When that happens, the mercury pours into the bowl. And then the mercury goes down into the bowl right here. Well, the atmosphere squeezes and pushes on all parts, and when the mercury poured into the bowl, it sagged down just a little bit and it left a space up at the top. So up at the top of that tube, there was considered to be a vacuum. So I wrote you a little description. A tube is filled with liquid mercury. It's plugged up and then turned upside down, and this mercury sags down into the bowl and it leaves a vacuum up at the top. That means that there's no pressure at all. Well, the atmosphere tries to squeeze in the mercury in all different directions, and what happens is that mercury has nowhere to go except up into this spot where there was no pressure. Now, when you look at the weather report, you'll see a number and it'll say something like 29.9 and rising and an R. So the 29.9 refers to how many inches tall this column of mercury is. So as the atmosphere pushes more and more, this rises up and gets taller. If the atmospheric pressure is lighter, then this is going to shrink and you get a shorter column of mercury. And I mentioned it earlier, the R refers to rising. There is also an S for steady and an F for falling. And this barometric pressure is used to tell us about rain patterns. Couple of fun facts for you or questions. When Lewis Carroll was writing Alice in Wonderland, you may have heard of the character, the Mad Hatter. Well, during Lewis Carroll's time, all of the hat makers at the time were kind of a little bit crazy. And it turns out that mercury had been used in the processing of the felt. And when that happens, the mercury seeps into your skin and it's absorbed and it has a cumulative poison that makes you go insane. That's the effect of mercury poisoning. So all of the hat makers during his time were a little crazy or mad. So that's where he came up with the name Mad Hatter. Well, next, I want you to think about if mercury is so dangerous, why wouldn't we use, let's say, water for a barometer instead? One, it's a little bit more sensitive to temperature changes, so it might actually freeze if it's outside. And two, water would evaporate faster. And as far as the weight or the density of it, water is about 14 times lighter than mercury. So for our barometer to have to work properly, it would have to be about 14 times as tall than a mercury one. And right now, the mercury barometers are about a meter tall. That's kind of a good gauge. So think about having something that was 14 of our meter sticks from the classroom big. That's not exactly very practical. Next, we're gonna talk about Pascal's principle. The actual principle states that pressure is transmitted unchanged throughout a fluid. In class, we're gonna have a miniaturized version of kind of the concept of a hydraulic lift, but I want to go over the picture with you so we can kind of talk about how that applies to Pascal's principle. In your notes, if you don't already have it drawn, there should be two little discs. Make sure one of them is bigger and one of them is smaller, and then connect them with a tube. Well, what happens is you apply a force on one side. Well, that area that you're applying a force on has a circular area to it, and a force divided by an area creates a pressure. Well, when you push down on one side and create that pressure, that same pressure is transmitted all the way through the fluid until it comes out the other end. And because there's a pressure at the other end, that means that there is another force and another area. 
so that when we push down on one side, that creates a pressure. The pressure goes all the way through, and it comes out the other side and makes the other end move. If you check back on Google Classroom, I also have a video clip that kind of shows you a hydraulic lift and explains this in a little bit more detail. But I did want to show you how to set up a problem, and I'm going to work an example with you. So let's do that next. According to Pascal's principle, the pressure on one side of a lift has to equal the pressure on the other side. So I gave subscripts of small and large to kind of go along with our visual picture on the previous slide. Now remember that pressure is force over area, so the pressure on the small side would be force on the small side over area of the small side, and then pressure on the large side would be force over area for the large section. If we kind of break that down and solve for the force on the large side, that ratio should be bigger than one, and this ratio is what's telling us how many times our force is multiplied. Again, we're gonna do a lab with Pascal's principle, so you'll get a feeling actually get to touch what that's like and hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense to you but for right now let's look at an example problem. We have a 25 newton force exerted on the small piston of a hydraulic lift and you are told the area of that piston and then we want to know the magnitude of the weight that can be lifted on the large side. You're also given that area so let's list our variables. So we want to look and make sure that both of our areas are in meters squared, which they are, and remember that weight is a type of force, so I just labeled that as the force on the large side. So we can set up our equation like you have at the top of the page and plug our numbers in. So your equation should look something like this. Let's plug the numbers in, solve the problem, and come back and check and see if you have it correct. When you plug in and set up your numbers, it should look like this, and you simply need to cross multiply. So go ahead and do that. I went ahead and walked you through all the steps, showed you what canceled out, and hopefully you got an answer of 50 newtons as the weight that's able to be lifted. In class next time, we are going to do a demonstration with what's called Cartesian divers, and the explanation will have to do with pressure, so leave some room in your notes. And also, I have a video clip for you on Google Classroom about Pascal's bases. We will see that in class as well as a demonstration. Our last principle for this section is called Bernoulli's principle, and it states that the greater the speed of a fluid, the less pressure it exerts on stationary walls. Now, when you come to class, we're going to do a demonstration with trying to knock a ping pong ball off of a bottle, depending on how quickly you can walk. And this will be used as an analogy for how much pressure or force a fluid can place on a solid wall, depending on its speed. We are going to do several demonstrations in class, but I did want to go over one of them with you here. So when you look at an airplane wing, this is going to be the cross-sectional area of a wing if you're looking at it from the side. So kind of visualize your airplane and you are staring at this little section right here. That's what this represents. So let's talk about the airflow. As a plane travels through the air, some of that fluid is going to go on top and some of it's going to go underneath. Well, that fluid actually meets up at the same time on this back part of the wing. What that tells us is because it has to travel a larger distance, that means it has to go faster on top of the wing and slower. So I'm going to draw a smaller arrow on the bottom of the wing. I'm going to change colors to represent the pressure. Because the fluid has a high speed, or high velocity, that means that it has a little tiny pressure pushing on that wall. Well, the opposite is true underneath the wing. Because underneath the wing there is a low velocity, it's got a very big pressure, giant pressure. And if you look at the size of the pressure pushing down as opposed to the pressure pushing up, that results in a net upward force or a lift effect. And that's one of the things that helps airplanes to be able to fly. Now again, we're gonna do several demonstrations in class, so bring your notes with you so that you can draw pictures and write down some more explanations as we go over these together.